are now in the final lecture of the ongoing series of Logos and the Muse, a, mythical, a journey of mythical history from an Orthodox Christian perspective. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for enduring these 10 weeks. Um, you guys must like to suffer as much as I do. Um, I'd like to thank George Dukin, my producer and cameraman. I'd like to thank Father James for giving me the opportunity to do this course. Uh, and thank my my long-suffering patient wife. <laughs> so the last few weeks have been discussed and was often referred to as the medieval synthesis. In the last lecture, I offered a orthodox reading or an attempt at an orthodox reading of Dante's Divine Comedy because the comedy really exemplifies the best of the medieval synthesis we've been discussing. But I want to end this series talking about a little bit more light-hearted things. We talk about mythical creatures, and we're talking about other forms of storytelling, um, things that are not considered high literature. We would be discussing things such as fairy tales and folk tales and the lives of the saints. Now, I'm not lumping in the lives of the saints in with fairy tales. What I am doing is including them in these forms of storytelling which were more common among the laity, more common among the everyday people. Because really they are a uh, distillation of the great themes and the epics and the great storytelling of, we find within um, the heroic epics, and the symbolic romances, um, and stuff within the ancient age <clears throat> as well. Um, they really are that distillation. You see those grand, those grand patterns really distilled down to a more digestible, easier form. And they're told and retold after generations, after generations and gener generations. Um, and we get in medieval hagiography, you see sometimes these stories become so fantastical that they resemble fairy tales or folk tales. Um, you especially find this within, within the British Isles, and the voyage of St. Brendan is one great example, which we will be looking at later in the lecture. But for now, I want to talk about animals and creatures. So animals are used symbolically within our tradition. Um, St. Nikolai Velimirovich, in his book, The Universe of Symbols and Signs, offers a symbolic reading of various animals. Um, we see very common within the Christian traditions, even outside the Orthodox ch Church, um, Christ is depicted as a lion, Christ is depicted as a lamb. We also see the four evangelists. Uh, which is this is actually more common in Western Christianity, but the four evangelists um, depicted as animals um, or beasts of different types. Uh, St. Matthew, though, who is he depicted as a man, uh, St. Mark as a lion, St. Luke as an ox, and St. John as an eagle. And many of these later depictions are winged creatures of resembling from uh, Ezekiel 1 and Revelation chapter 4. What about mythical creatures. And this is where I want to start this discussion with that question, what do we do when we come across readings that contain mythical creatures? We hear this within our own hymnography. We hear about dragons in scripture. Uh, Psalm 90 is an example. Also a basilisk in there. Uh, the Viathan is mentioned within uh, Psalms 103, which we say at Vespers every week, or every Vespers. So what are we to make of these? What do we do when we read an old story and our eyes glance over one of those words? Uh, we come across something as a fairy or a sprite or a griffin. What do we do with these things? Do we just kind of like chuckle to ourselves and move along? Or do we embrace this as part of our tradition? So due to rationalism, empiricism, and science, we no longer believe in mythical beasts or in otherworldly beings. However, we do have a tradition, as I just mentioned, that does include these. Um, for example, St. George and the Dragon. Uh, within the Voyage of St. Brendan, which I briefly mentioned already, we see sea monsters, fire-breathing monsters. Um, we also see the during some of the prayers, especially the prayers of the blessing of the water. The, the priest talks about the, the beasts that lurk within the waters. Uh, the icon of St. Anthony the Great is another great example. Is one who shows it depicting all kinds of demons that are manifest, look like dragons and strange creatures, lions' bodies with like human-like faces. There's also the icon of St. Christopher, uh, 
the traditional icons. And Christopher, I mean, has him depicted a dog-headed man. So what do we do with these? Do you just arrogantly dismiss them as products of past superstitions? Or do we embrace them as part of our holy tradition? So C.S. Lewis tells us the people of the Middle Ages try to find a place for all things. Even though they did not necessarily believe all of these things, but they did not dismiss them entirely like a modern scientific man would have, or we do to this day. Remember, pre-modern people did not believe um, that there was a much of a distinction between myth and history. So, to learn more about medieval animals, the best place is, is the best source is the medieval bestiary. So the one I'm going to be drawing from today is the Bodley 764 manuscript. So I'm going to talk about a few of these, and I'm just going to read directly from the bestiary here and show the cool pictures. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the griffin. And you can see the griffin here, a hybrid beast. So according to the text, the griffin is at once feathered and four-footed. It lives in the south and in the mountains. The hinder part of its body is like a lion. Its wings and face are like an eagle. It hates the horse bitterly, and if it comes face to face with a man, it will attack him. So in the earlier Middle Ages, the griffins were seen as hostile to human beings. When we get to later development, like in Dante, um, we see this in the Purgatorio, that the griffins became symbols of Christ, since they are of two natures. Now, the phoenix is another interesting one. <clears throat> There's a little picture of a phoenix here. The before phoenix. And then the after phoenix. As you, his rebirth and fire. So, the phoenix is a bird from Arabia, so-called either because its color is like the dye from Phoenicia, or because it is unique in the whole world. It lives for 500 years, and when it feels itself growing old, it collects twigs from aromatic plants and builds itself a pyre, on which it sits and spreads its wings to the rays of the sun, setting itself on fire. When it has been consumed, a new bird arises next day out of the ashes. It is a symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ, who says, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. John 10:18. The phoenix has the power to kill itself and bring itself to life. Why, O oh foolish man, do you grow angry at the word of God, who is the true Son of God? For our Savior descended from heaven and unfolded his wings, which were filled with the sweet scent of the Old and New Testament. He sacrificed himself to God the Father on the altar of the cross and rose again on the third day. The phoenix is known to live in certain places in Arabia and live for 500 years. When it knows that the end of its life is approaching, it builds, this is another definition of it, it builds a chrysalis of frankincense and myrrh and other spices. And when it's about to expire, it goes into the chrysalis and dies. From its flesh, a worm emerges, from which gradually grows up. In due course, it grows wings and appears in the form of the previous bird. The bird teaches us by its example to believe in the resurrection. The resurrection is an event without parallel, without the benefit of reason. The phoenix reduce, produces all the signs of the resurrection. But the birds are there to teach man, not man to teach the birds. It is therefore an example to us that the author and creator of birds does not suffer his saints to die eternally, but wishes to restore them by using his own life force. So with these creatures, the phoenix, we can see them as a symbol of the resurrection. Um, and then in more modern stories, actually, see when the Harry Potter stories, the phoenix comes into play. Um, and honestly, probably the most common thing for phoenix is, I mean, here's about Phoenix, Arizona, which I guess is really hot and probably feels like you're on fire when living there. 
Maybe that's why they named it that. I don't know. But either way, the phoenix in the Christian tradition is understood as a symbol of resurrection. Um, now the last one we're going to look at real quick as far as mythical beasts is the dragon. Now everyone likes talking about dragons. <clears throat> so the dragon is larger than all the rest of the serpents and then all the other animals in the world. The Greeks call it the Dracontum. Dracontum. From this comes its Latin name Draco. It is said that it is often tempted to come out of caves into the air, and the air is shaken by it. It has a crest, a small mouth, and narrow nostrils through which it breathes and puts out its tongue. Strength is not in its teeth but its tail, and it harms more by blows than by force of impact. It has no harmful poison, but it is said that it does not need, does not need poison in order to kill because it slays anything which it embraces. Not even the elephant, with its huge body, is safe from it. It lies concealed near the paths which elephants are in the habit of using, entangles their feet in its coils, and suffocates them to death. Its home are Ethiopia and India, where there is always heat. This dragon is like the devil, the fairest of all serpents, who often leaves his cave to rush into the air. The air glows because of him, because the devil rises from his abyss and transforms himself into an angel of light, deceiving fools with hopes of vainglory and human pleasures. The dragon has a crest because the devil is the king of pride. Its strength lies not in its teeth but in its tail because having lost his power, the devil can only deceive with lies. It lurks on the path which elephants use because the devil lays the coils of sin in the path of all those who make their way towards heaven. It kills them when they are suffocated by sin. For if anyone dies in chains of guilt, he will without doubt be condemned to hell. <clears throat> so St. Marcarius the Great says this, The heart itself is but a small vessel, yet dragons are there, and there are also lions. There are poisonous beasts and all the treasures of evil. But there too is God, the angels, the life, and the kingdom, the light, and the apostles the heavenly cities, and the treasuries of grace. All things are there, and descend into your heart and do battle with Satan. So in Western mythology, dragons have always been understood as evil, monstrous, incredibly dangerous to humans. In Eastern mythology, there's a difference, and they are often revered for their magic and beauty. But we are focused more on the Western tradition, since that is where we come from. In the West, they are a source of chaos and destruction, a monster to be fought like in Beowulf. And Tolkien is true to this also in his legendarium, where the dragons are of the utmost evil, only surpassed by Morgoth himself, and they are greedy treasure hoarders, which is also like the dragon in Beowulf. So often equated with the serpent, they are also seen as symbols of change, deception, and knowledge, at least knowledge acquired before one is ready for that knowledge, much like we see the serpent tempts Eve. As previously said, St. Marcarius tells us that the dragons lurk within our own heart. <clears throat> and the last one I want to discuss, not beasts per se, but fairies. <clears throat> so, I'm going to draw from C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image to discuss these creatures. So he first states, of course, that the medieval model, this all-encompassing model, does not really assign the fairies as an official status within the system, within the model, medieval model. So this leaves plenty of room for the imagination, hence which is their value and their imaginative power. So quoting C.S. Lewis, Take from them the name, the Longevi, which is the word he uses to refer to the fairies. Take, take from them the name Longevi, were from Martinius Capella, who mentions dancing companies of Longevi who haunt woods, glades, and groves, and lakes, and springs, and brooks, whose names are pans, fawns, satyrs, sylvans, nymphs. Bernardus Silvestris, without using the word longevi, describes similar creatures, sylvans, pans, and neri, as long as having a longer life than ours. 
though they are not immortal, they are innocent of blameless conversation and have bodies of elemental purity. So according to the tradition, according to Lewis, the fairies inhabit this in-between place between heaven and earth, or between the ether and the earthly realms. So some lore tells us that these are creatures that fell from the heavenly abode, but did not fall entirely like the demons did. So they are creatures on the edge between these two categories, between heaven and earth. So this makes them a little erratic and capricious. So Lewis goes on to discuss the sort of taxonomy of these, en- of these beings. He offers up several different theories of where they come from. Some say they are angelic beings. Some that they are a different class of rational species. And some that they are the dead, or at least a special class of the dead. This last idea is almost congruent with what we were discussing uh, a couple weeks ago about what happened to the demons within literature and talking about the different types of demons and how the ones that tempt us are the ones that, uh, according to Father Stephen de Young, were the spirits of the dead giants of the Old Testament. But either way, these erratic creatures inhabit a world between heaven and earth. And why we're discussing them is because when we discuss fairy tales and folk tales, these types of stories are full of the fairy realm. So, talking about fairy tales and folklore, now there's a fine line between these two genres. Um, They're both very, very old forms of storytelling, and as I said, they're a distillation of the many of the tropes and the forms and the patterns which we found in older literature of the epics and the romances. So fairy tales would contain more supernatural elements, whereas the folk tales may not. So stories of this sort were very popular in Ireland and Britain, British Isles because of this idea of the thin places, which is that, that veil that between this world and the other world is very, very thin. And sometimes beings would cross over, and sometimes people would cross, find themselves in the fairy realm, actually crossing through these thin places. And these places on the edge between these two worlds usually had some residue of this worldly otherworldly spiritualness. And sometimes you consider these places to be sacred or holy. So this idea became integral to the Celtic Christianity. So the Chronicles of Narnia is a modern version of this idea, and it should come as no surprise that Lewis himself was Irish. And uh, within Russia and the other Slavic lands have a deep fairy tale tradition uh, Ivan and the Great Wolf is a very, very famous one. Uh, Ilya Muromets is another great hero, which is actually based on a saint, St. Elias, the wonder worker of the Kiev caves. So we're going to be discussing a little bit more about the role that fairy tales play in spiritual devel- uh, imaginative development. So I'm going to be relying on Ivan Ilyin, um, Russian philosopher who gave an interesting lecture he read in Berlin on May, 9, May 3rd, excuse me, 1934, about the spiritual meaning of stories, specifically fairy tales. So it's a very interesting time. I mean, they're right, Germany's right on edge of full you know, Nazi totalitarianism. And then you've got Ivan Ilyin talking about fairy tales to them. So, Ivan Ilyin says this, don't think that the fairy tale is childish, is a childish diversion, not worthy of the attention of a grown man. And don't think that adults are smart and children stupid. Don't imagine that an adult has to stupefy himself to tell a story to a child. Is it not perhaps the opposite? Are our minds the source of most of our woes? And what is stupidity anyway? Is all stupidity dangerous or shameful? Or is there perhaps an intelligent kind of stupidity, something desirable and blessed that begins with stupidity but ends with wisdom? 
maybe there are two kinds of stupidity. One comes from blind self-contentment, the other from a healthy skepticism. One stupefies with pride and leads to vulgarity, while the other stupefies through humility and leads to wisdom. This sort of stupidity, or perhaps better called simplicity, exactly describes all folk tales, especially Russian folk tales. The fairy tale doesn't insist on anything. It doesn't intrude on anyone. It's not in the least contrived. If you don't want to listen, then don't. It's like a flower, but not one from a cultivated garden. It's like a wildflower in the field that sows itself, that roots itself, that pushes its own flower petals up toward God's sunlight. This flower gives its own kind of honey, a wondrous and fragrant honey that only a simple and wise beekeeper can harvest. The same is true of the spiritual meaning of the fairy tale. It's like refined and sweet-smelling honey. If you drip it on your tongue, you'll taste all the ineffable essence of Russia's nature, the smell of the earth, the heat of the sun, the fragrance of flowers, and something else that is subtle and rich, something eternally youthful, yet eternally ancient. All this in its ineffable taste and smell. End quote. So what Ivan Elian is saying is that the fairy tale although simple, contains much, much meaning. And then these stories are not, not simply for children. And that's something we're going to circle back to later. Perhaps if more children were raised on these types of stories, we wouldn't have such dysfunctional adults, because modernity's skepticism of anything pre-modern, was in, which is also inherited by the postmodern thought, and postmodernity is distrustful of all meta-narratives, all grand overarching stories. So instead of postmodern storytelling um, is really one of subversion and inversion. So this, this type of story does have its place. When a culture is, sets up strictures for meaning contingent on the suspicion of narrative, because one sees the influence from the storyteller themselves in the narrative, then we inevitably have no room for true storytelling. The end of this deconstruction becomes the very thing it wanted to eradicate, which is propaganda. So Ilian continues this, the themes of these stories reside in wise depths of human instinct somewhere deep inside those holy depths where the knots of national essence and national character reside and where they await their final resolution, completion, and freedom. No proud man, no coward, no faithless, crooked soul can plumb these depths of national spiritual experience. Only the trusting, sincere, contemplative simpleton, brave in his poetic seriousness, can reach those depths and come out from there rich with fairy tales. For such a man, these fairy tales are not fabrications or tall tales, but poetic illumination, essential reality, even the beginning of all philosophy. Fairy tales don't become obsolete if we lose the wisdom to live by it. No, it is we who have perverted our emotional and spiritual culture, and we will dissipate and die off if we lose our access to these tales. So for Ilian, he is audacious to say that even the fairy tale is possibly the beginning of all philosophy. And then if we cut ourselves off from these stories, ultimately, as a culture, we will begin to die. So, gone 10 weeks ago, we started this series talking about the logos spermaticos in all cultures. So these seeds of truth eventually grew and prepared cultures to accept Christ. But now we're shifting away from this idea of a truth to meaning. So C.S. Lewis tells us that the fertile ground of meaning has to be cultivated and intended in order for the seeds of truth to grow. And good stories, especially fairy tales, provide the fertile ground of meaning. That is why it's so important that these stories be read to children and also by children, and they will aid in forming the spiritual and their spiritual and moral imaginations. And this is why adults need to be reading these as well, at least part of our reading regimen. Not necessarily everything we read is this, but part of our regimen, because adults need to rekindle 
the childlike wonder of the world. Now, folk tales are part of the broader term folklore, and fairy tales fall within this umbrella term. So there's really not a huge difference between these two types of stories, except as I previously mentioned, the fairy tale is more full of the supernatural. Whereas folk stories don't necessarily have to have these, but for our purposes, we're just, gonna lump, we're just lumping them together. What is fascinating about the folk tradition, though, is that it includes more than just storytelling. There's other folk customs like songs, dancing, and art, and even ritual-like ritual -like activities. And so folklore is really this foundational and formational body of knowledge, which is both oral and written. And even there's unspoken beliefs that are just integrated within a community, which would be kind of similar to what philosopher Charles Taylor calls the conditions of belief. But at all points, at some point, all these started as an oral tradition. And eventually they were written down. Because this corpus of knowledge really is that distillation of the socio and cultural religious and religious meaning embodied within a given culture. As what sociologist Peter Berger would call the sediment of a culture. Now the power of fairy stories are in their efficacy to offer what uh, J.R.R. Tolkien refers to as the fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. <clears throat> so quoting Tolkien from his On Fairy Stories essay, it says, if adults are to read fairy stories as a natural branch of literature, neither playing at being children nor pretending to be choosing for children, nor being boys who would not grow up, what are the values and functions of this kind? That is, I think, the last and most important question. I have already hinted at some of my answers. First of all, if written with art, the prime value of fairy stories will simply be that value which is, as literature, they share with other literary forms. But fairy stories offer also, in a peculiar degree or mode, these things, fantasy, recovery, escape, consolation all things of which children have, as a rule, less need than older people. Most of them are nowadays very commonly considered to be bad for anybody. I will consider them briefly, and I will begin with fantasy. <clears throat> so Tolkien starts off talking about fantasy. There's one element that all fantastical stories have, which include the, folk, uh, include the fairy stories, is this arresting strangeness. In this arresting strangeness, we also see in other forms of literature, such as weird fiction and the old school horror genres of like Edgar Allan Poe, Arthur Macon, H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, and the list goes on. And I even get it with some of the Robert E. Howard stories. So why these are fascinating is that there's just regular people doing regular things, going about their day, and then something weird, something out of the ordinary, invades their world, invades their isolation. And they have to contend with whatever that is, whatever that chaos or evil or monstrous thing is. At that moment, they have to choose they want to enter onto the heroic path or not. And the ones who do, either they die or go insane, some of them, <laughs> You know, uh, this, this could be metaphorical, perhaps, of the descent into the underworld is not ultimately that successful with these kinds of stories. It's something that they just never return. They never have the ascent upwards. But for Tolkien, this strangeness is key. It means that we've entered a different realm. And this is key for all imaginative fiction. And this is where enchantment happens. <clears throat> So Tolkien talks about the other three, recovery, escape, and consolation, in, in a, in a, in a, as a set. <clears throat> and quoting from the professor himself, I have claimed that escape is one of the main functions of fairy stories, and since I do not disprove or disapprove of them, it is plain that I do not accept the tone of scorn or pity with which escape is now so often used, a tone which 
the uses of the word outside literary criticism give no warrant at all. And what the misusers of escape are fond of calling real life escape is evidently as a rule very practical and may even be heroic. In real life, it is difficult to blame it unless it fails. In criticism, it would seem to be the worse, the better it succeeds. Evidently, we are faced by a misuse of words, and also by a confusion of thought. Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. And using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. So what Tolkien's talking about here is that fantastical stories were deemed escapist, meaning you're escaping from your life. It's almost a form of sedative makes you happy, content, even though the, your life is terrible. And I used to be of this mindset, too. You know, real fix, realist fiction is what we need to be reading. And the fantastical stuff is just escapism. But what Tolkien's telling us is that there's nothing wrong with the prisoner who wants to escape. <laughs> it's not the same thing as the deserter who wants to escape his duty as a soldier. And stories have this impact of being able to offer a little escape from the life, but good stories will help us live that life better, not just, not just to sedate and delude. And when talking about consolation for Tolkien, consolation is found in the, his term eucatastrophe which is a neologism that means the happy catastrophe. An example of this that Tolkien uses is the Evangelium, or the good news of Christ. With this, we turn um, to the lives of the saints more now, because now we're getting into more common Christian territory. The good news of Christ, which seems like a catastrophe, the death on the cross, ultimately is the good news and salvation of humanity. So it is the happy catastrophe. And the lives of the saints are really an embodiment of the Evangelium. <clears throat> so now we're going to shift from fairy tales to hagiography. <clears throat> and I've been using the word hagiography often throughout this, this, this course. So if you're not familiar with the word hagiography, it's just the lives of the saints. So the lives of the saints were an immensely popular form of storytelling in the Middle Ages. It's almost more popular, just as popular as, as folk tales and fairy tales. And that should really come as no surprise to you, because as we go in the last almost ten, no, this is the tenth week in this in this course, that the Middle Ages was a thoroughly Christian era. So of course, the lives of the saints as a form of storytelling is really central to medieval Christians. So we're going to look at two saints before we wrap up this last lecture. The first one is going to be St. George. And I said a few weeks ago, I'm going to talk about St. George more. So in the Orthodox tradition, St. George is a soldier. He is primarily known as a great martyr and victory bearer. But he is also known as a wonder worker. In our, in our hagiographical tradition, St. George is known for a miracle where he tames or slays a dragon-like serpent and saves the ruler of the city's daughter whom he was going to feed to the monster, to placate the monster. That's the, that's the basic story. So the story evolved into the medieval legend of St. George the Dragon Slayer. And in this, he rescues a princess and becomes also this prototype of knighthood. As I said a couple of weeks ago, how Alexander the Great and even in also St. George were sort of a model for medieval knighthood. So the story gained in popularity during the Crusades, this idea of rescuing the princess, going into battle and slaying dragons. The Crusaders wore the red cross on white, 
which is known as the Cross of St. George. This is also now also the, the flag of England. So much like Alexander playing role in terms of mythic history, so does St. George, as I said, as providing a model for knighthood. So as I said previously, medieval, um, the medie medieval hagiography was, began to resemble, um, took on a whole life of its own and became legends and stories surrounding saints that sort of the, um, grew from the, the original stories of the lives of the saints and miracles attributed to them. <clears throat> so, St. Brendan. We have a story called The Voyage of St. Brendan. And I highly recommend everyone read this story. If you've not read it, you, you need to pause the video and go read it and then come back. For those of you who are not doing that, which is probably everybody, I'm going to continue. So, um, The Voyage of St. Brendan reads more of a fantastical adventure, but it's still hagiography. So St. Brendan, along with his 14 companions, they seek to find the promised land of the saints, an island that one of the other monks that they knew had actually discovered. <clears throat> so the seafaring journey was really popular in Irish lore and Irish folk tales. And that's exactly the form of literature that this is, is a seafaring journey. So from the text, we see, I quote, St. Brendan entered the boat, and with hoisted sail, they set off westward into the summer solstice. They had a favorable wind and needed to go to do no more than trim the sail. But after 15 days, the wind dropped, and they rowed and rowed until their strength failed. And straightway, St. Brendan began to give them words of comfort and encouragement. Brothers, you have nothing to fear, for God is our helper. He is our navigator and helmsman, and he shall guide us. Pull in the oars and the rudder, spread the sail, and let God do as he wishes with his servants and their boat. Every day they ate in the evening. Every now and again a wind sprang up, but they could not tell from which direction it came or in which direction the boat was driven. So St. Brennan and his 14 fellow travelers set sail, and they f appeared to flow aimlessly through the sea. <laughs> But they weren't really floating aimlessly. They were being guided by God himself on their journey. And St. Brendan being their, um, their, their abbot <coughs> encouraged them to trust in God. So the seafaring journey, as I said, is very popular in Irish culture. And we see also within other ancient epics, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Argonautica as well. And this becomes a uh, sort of a Christian, or that the seafaring journey recasted in Christian terms. So this, the story gets this restructured. But what makes this voyage unique, though, is that in terms of... It is told in terms of liturgy and sacrament as a liturgizing of the journey. Or maybe better say, a, litur a liturgification of sea journey. We see that St. Brendan and his fellow company travel around this archipelago for seven years. <clears throat> And they end up spending holy days at the same locations. I will read more from the text. <clears throat> As they sat at the table, the bird, who had spoken to them last year, settled on the prow of the boat, extended its wings, and made a noise like the sound of a great organ. The man of God knew that it wanted to tell them something. The bird said, God has appointed four places for you, for each season of the year, where you shall stay until the seven years of your pilgrimage are over. You shall spend Maundy Thursday with your steward, who is their last 
there each year, the Easter Vigil on the back of a whale, the Feast of Easter until the octave of Pentecost with us, and the Nativity of the Lord with the community of Alby. At the end of seven years, after great trials of different kinds, you will find the promised land of the saints, which you seek, and there you shall live for forty days before God shall lead you back to the land of your birth. The holy abbot and his brothers threw themselves to the ground, thanking and praising their creator. When the venerable old man rose to the feet, the bird flew back to his place. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as we see, St. Brendan and his company travel around on a boat for seven years between different islands off the coast of Ireland. And they spent Holy Week Easter, Christmas, and Pentecost in the same locations. On Holy Saturday, their boat makes uh, birth immediately above the great sea monster. In that story, it said a whale, but earlier you also see that he is a great sea monster, which in itself is significant in terms of Christ harrowing Hades and Christ um, equating himself with or fulfilling Jonah, the, the prophet Jonah, in the story of being swallowed by the great fish. So they spent Easter on the island of the bird, paradise of birds, and Christmas in a monastery in silence. During this story, they even run into Judas Iscariot once, which is a very interesting dialogue between Brendan and Judas Iscariot. And at the end of the journey, they arrive at the promised land of the saints. And they stay there for 40 days. Of course, leading up to that period of time, you could see the seven years as a period of uh, trial, a period of uh, purification before they can arrive at the promised promise land of the saints. So they stay there for a bit and then they make their journey back home where St. Brendan falls asleep in the Lord. So it's really, it's really a wonderful story. And if you haven't read it, read it you really need to read it. <laughs> because it exemplifies this idea of medieval storytelling. Probably one of the best examples of what we've been discussing. So in this lecture, we discussed mythical creatures, fairy tales, and hagiography, and the roles in forming the moral and spiritual imagination. And the seeds of truth need a fertile ground of meaning for them to germinate. So we also briefly looked at the stories of St. George and St. Brendan. We discussed dragons and griffins and phoenixes and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And the reason why I wanted to discuss some of these things is, is a reminder that storytelling is supposed to be fun. And it should help us rekindle a childlike wonder of the world. Okay, now I want to go ahead and offer some closing remarks for the entire series. So I first want to circle back to... Um, what we discussed in the opening of the first lecture. And there I, I try to impress upon everyone who is listening the need to cultivate an orthodox spiritual and moral imagination. In other words, cultivate the orthodox phronema. Because we are constantly inundated from influences outside of ourselves all day. We are um, influenced by the media, social media, influenced by um, just our culture, uh, uh, culture as a whole, movies, television, uh, family, education system, so on and so forth. And all these groups tend to have their own agenda, tend to have their own worldview, which is oftentimes at odds with our own. So th there's an imperative, there's a great need right now in our postmodern society to really focus on cultivating the orthodox spiritual, moral, and imagination. And what we did was we looked at the first, the first about five weeks, we discussed how the early church interacted with the pagan culture, how they, had, they integrated some of the stories into their own, how they discarded some. We saw like St. Clement of Alexandria, for example, spoke about how secular uh, writing literature and philosophy uh, could act as a um, sort of a purgative effect on the soul. St. Basil also did the same thing, um, taught us how the pagan literature was sort of a lesser light to adjust your eyes to the greater light of the Christian tradition. <clears throat> 
in the second half, we began to see how the church integrated all these stories into their own tradition, into their own stories, into their art, and how they, it's the term, the great synthesis. At the end of the first half, I mentioned that we were about to enter into sort of the second movement of a concerto. The, and but the problem is now we're ending, and you're like, where is the third? Because concertos are in three movements. So where is this third movement you're speaking about? Well, the third is really to take what we have learned in the last 10 weeks, integrate it into our lives, to apply it, to live it out, and essentially to become storytellers ourselves, to be creators of culture. From the Russian philosopher Ivan Elian's book, The Foundations of Christian Culture, he talks about this concern, how does, a Christ, how does Christianity integrate with their own culture, if it's even worth doing that anymore, or what should we do? And he tells us we become creators of culture. So I'll just read from Ilian's text. I quote, so what is left for a Christian? To eject culture outright because of his Christian principles? To interpret Christianity in such a way that he denies its power to transform mankind's deeds, life, and fate? To decide that Christ did not come to save mankind, not to call sinners to repentance, not to convert them to a new life, but to leave them to perish in blindness, debauchery, and decomposition? We cannot accept this as true. This is an incorrect interpretation of Christianity's role in the world, making even the strictest Buddhism more optimistic and humanistic. This would mean... This would mean a rejection or even perversion of the profound meaning of Christ's coming. It would mean ceasing to become a Christian at all, for a Christian is not called to flee the world or mankind to eject or curse them. He is called to bring the light of Christ's teaching into earthly life, to creatively reveal the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the fabric of this life. And this means that we must create a Christian culture on this earth. So hopefully this series we begin to understand the importance of creating an authentic Christian culture here at the local level, at the parish level. It is a great role of the church. It almost can be an act of mission. And for more on how the church acts missionally, so in ontological and sacramental terms, I recommend checking out my blog, thecitysetonthehill.com, and we'll provide the links in the show notes. But our culture is one which is spiritually bankrupt, and our job as a church is to become sub-creators, to become storytellers. We must stop complaining about the culture out there and start creating our own, like our forebears in the faith did. Not create some kind of religious subculture or kitsch or things that have become derivative of the mainstream, which I've seen way too often, even coming from my own evangelical background, uh, this idea of creating a subculture derived from the mainstream is ultimately just becomes pointless. We must learn from the ancestors of the faith did. We must do it again in the here and the now. Thank you.